Hi, everyone. Um, how many of you guys are developers? How many have games out in the marketplace? How many are about ready to how many are about ready to release games in the marketplace? Excellent. Well, first, before we, I'll give you a, a, sort of an overview of our panel today. So I'm going to introduce myself, and I'll introduce our, any, every panelist will introduce themselves. And we have some questions prepared for everybody that you are not aware of, but we are all aware of. And then um, I have some general, broader questions. But I also want to make this very interactive. And this is your conference. You guys are here to get knowledge and access to people. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, and we will um, in integrate it into the whole presentation. All right? So without further ado, I'm Jolene Winther Hughes. I own a boutique law firm in Seattle, Washington, where we work with a lot of big gaming companies. And we provide in-house counsel for these companies on a pretty robust level. And two of our clients are actually on the panel, and I'll let them introduce themselves. But first, uh, David, will you get us started? Yeah, my name is David Zemke. I'm a director of mobile business development with DNA. And uh, for those of you who don't know DNA, you might be familiar with Mobagi, which is our platform that we publish under. But uh, DNA is uh, a top grossing mobile publisher around the world. Our main goal is just to delight and impact gamers worldwide with a lot of great social mobile games. So. Uh, my name is Bard. Uh, I work at Blue Giraffe. We founded Blue Giraffe uh, two and a half years ago, and we've been developing first party games for Game House, which is about 80% of our uh, work currently. And uh, why we differentiate by actually investing a lot of time in building compelling stories uh, with, uh, uh, with fun gameplay. Hi, my name is Amy Dallas. I'm one of the four co-founders of Clutch Play Games out of Portland, Oregon. And my experience is actually a little different than the rest of the panel. Uh, we mainly make uh, premium games as opposed to freemium and free to play. So um, we learned a lot of lessons along the way. So definitely happy to be here. I'm Mike Sandwick. I'm on the business development team at Tinyco. Um, Tinyco is a free to play mobile game developer. We were founded in 2009. Uh, we're based here in San Francisco, and uh, our big game that's currently out is called Family Guy The Quest for Stuff, uh, which we created in partnership with Fox for the TV show Family Guy. You hold on to that mic, young man. Very good. Um, Mike, as a person in charge of market strategy at your company, how okay. crucial are partnerships with the big companies like Apple or Fox? What, what impact is that in your business? Sure. Uh, is that not working? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I work on our go-to-market strategy, which means our two kind of biggest classes of partners are, number one, the platforms, so Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, primarily. And uh, those guys are obviously incredibly important. We, uh, we live and die by their existence. Um, and we've been working with them really closely ever since I started working at Tinyco like two years ago. Um, and there are a couple things that I think we try to keep in mind in general uh, just to kind of make those relationships as successful as possible. Um, the first thing uh, is really obvious but is actually incredibly, incredibly important, um, which is from a partnership standpoint, whenever you're um, working on a game that's not out yet or you're creating content for a game that is out, uh, it's really important to be able to uh, clearly state the value of your game, what makes it awesome, what makes it fun, and specifically what differentiates it from other games. Um, so all of the, the platform partners, these guys have you know, more insight into the mobile games market than anybody else in the entire industry. Um, they're talking to everybody, they know what's working and what's not working, uh, and they know what people are working on that's not out yet across the entire portfolio of mobile game developers. So they really um, kind of understand what's happening on the bleeding edge of development. That's kind of a, uh, a blessing and a curse, I guess. It means that the onus is on you as the developer to really demonstrate your value and the differentiation that you know, your game has. It also means that um, your platform partners are an incredible, incredible source of insight and feedback. Um, so one of the things that we try to do all the time when we're engaging our platform partners is get them to give us honest, almost like brutally honest feedback about what we're working on. Um, what works, what doesn't work, what they like, what they think is boring, 
Um, and some of the best product feedback we've ever gotten for any of our titles comes from uh, that relationship. I think it's also really helpful because ultimately, um, you know, the platforms want your business and your products to succeed. Uh, so the more you can work with them to make that happen and kind of tap into the expertise that they have, um, the more success you're going to have. And then the last thing, which is, I guess, a, a little bit of a minor point compared to the, the last two things I was talking about, um, is that all of the platforms are constantly developing and releasing tons of technology for, to, to help game developers make games. You know, whether it's a new programming language or, um, you know, a social layer for your games or a graphics engine. Uh, and they work really hard on that stuff and they care about it. And they care about when their partners use that technology that they've worked really hard on. Um, and that's, you know, something that I think is really important to be on top of in terms of like, okay, WWDC just happened or Google I.O. just happened. Um, what's all the new stuff that they're releasing and how can we integrate a bunch of that technology into our products to, you know, be a good partner and evangelize the platform? Um, so, yeah, I think those are kind of three big things on the platform side, uh, yeah, that we try to keep in mind. And David, with respect to longevity, working with these big companies, how does that fit into a strategy of getting access to these companies and then creating a game that stays in the top charts or people are actually finding and downloading? So the first part of your question is how does how does that the platforms play into you know the strategy of long term gaming? Sure. I think most importantly, when you set out to build a game, we see at least at DNA, uh, we see games as a service, and so we always aim to delight our users in some form or another. And by creating a game as a service, you really want to keep engaging gamers again and again. So it's important to look at that from the time you create a game and, and build the you know the initial models and the prototypes that you have, and then think about that in your long term strategy. So for us at DNA, some of the longest, um, some of our longest games have been out on the market over two years. Uh, at one point, we had um, Marvel War Heroes launch in 2012, and it's still a very top-grossing title on both iOS and Android. The same goes for Transformers Legends, launched in uh, 2013. It's still a top-grossing title right now. And a big secret to our, I mean, a big part of our success has always been having constant events and things that were built in in the inception of the game and also currently now that keep gamers coming back and more and more, whether it's special events or new art or things like that. We've got a pipeline and a system to do that. So I encourage you guys to think about it when you think about games. It's not just about launch and, and forget these days. It's really about launch and engage and, and delight your users and keep them coming back more and more because that's what makes longevity in games happen. And the amazing thing about the, the mobile marketplace these days is that the digital storefronts are up 24-7, but once the game goes live, it's up there for as long as you want it to be. You know, we're no longer constrained by retail or anything like that. We can put games up and leave them up there as long as we need to be. They're always available. So keep that in mind. Bart, do you have any different perspectives since you're our sole represent, representative outside of the U.S. today on this panel? Um, no, no, I can confirm that, it, that it's exactly the same in Europe as well. Um, and we also see that uh, uh, Netflix has been, has been introduced in, in Holland last year. And before that, we, we had just like linear television and you had YouTube and stuff like that, but not like a subscription-based, all-you-can-eat, uh, binging uh, platform. And we see a lot of trends uh, with binging on television move to mobile as well. So building a franchise uh, of multiple titles uh, with a very strong story has given us the opportunity to get uh, players engaged on one title and then move them all through the chain up until uh, title 10, uh, which will be launched, uh, which has been launched uh, uh, last summer. So I think from a longevity point of view, um, uh, story and um, uh, is a very strong component in, in building a, a, a very strong user base. Amy, you have dual experience having worked in some big gaming companies and you're a recent, not that recent anymore, but a recent startup founder. Um, obviously the pressures are a lot different in both environments. Uh, how do you approach the life cycle of game develop differently or do you? You definitely do. Yeah, I did get this working. Um, so it was interesting. We were part of a larger company. My company was founded about two and a half years ago. 
when the studio we were working for got shut down. And so literally the next day, we all got together and decided, okay, we can do this because we've done this successfully for another company. So we know we can make great games. We know we can engage users. It's, it's, this is perfect. So we're just gonna go ahead and go for it. And it's interesting because when you work for a larger company, especially a free to play company, the strategy is very different. Um, as part of a studio system, a lot of the marketing is done and it's kind of opaque to you. It's happening in the background. You're not necessarily completely exposed to all the, the inner workings of the marketing department. And so you launch your game as a development team and suddenly it's being featured by Apple and Google and it's, it's all very successful. And so it's very different when you're an ND because obviously you have to be good at everything. You can't rely on someone else to make great things happen for you. And I think with free to play, it's very interesting because I think that there is less of a, a run up that needs to happen to build excitement. Uh, you can kind of, the, the life cycle for marketing your game can be a little bit shorter. And then you can put your game out there, you can iterate on it. And it's, when you launch your game, it's the beginning of a longer customer relationship that you're gonna have. When you're premium, it's a totally different thing because you have, you have to build excitement so people will want to play your game and so the platforms will want to feature you because if you don't get those features, you're not going to be as successful. So you have to start marketing your game way, way, way in advance. You need to be going to uh, festivals and showing your game. You need to be trying to court the press, getting on various forums and letting people know, hey, we're out here, it's going to be super exciting and you're going to want to play it. So. Uh, that's part of it. And then the other part of it is once you've launched a freemium or a premium game, uh, there's a, a much shorter shelf life because it's not software as a service. So basically, uh, you have to find ways once your sales drop off to kind of reinvigorate the interest in the game. So some ways to do that are going free ad supported. That's a really great way. Um, participating in things like free app a day program where suddenly a, a big infusion of people are grabbing your game and you're jumping up the chart. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a different strategy going the indie premium route. So um, David, as a veteran of the industry, you've worked with a lot of major game titles and you can name drop if you'd like. Um, <laughs> but you have a unique perspective on what creates longevity. So what are some secrets that you would give to game developers to lure users in and then keep them. You had mentioned a little bit about that before. Well, if I tell you secrets, I have to kill you all. <laughs> so, no, uh, so to, to the first part of your um, question is really what are some ways to keep users in and, and you know, engage them? I think first and foremost, um, it's pretty simple. Start with a great game. Start with an idea that you know you want to play over and over again, right? It seems simple, but you know, that's why I think it's important to spend a lot of time prototyping and testing and playing games. And then when you crystallize that idea, and really get it into a form that you know is, is going to be awesome. Take the next step then and then think about ways that you're going to bring people back into that game. And do that in the strategy phase of, of interesting ways of how you want to engage them past launch. Because really the, the winners in this industry, when you look at the top grossing charts, are the games that sort of have people coming back over and over again. And they're doing this through a series of either events or content updates or uh, other significant things going on in the game. You know, for example, we just launched, when we had Transformers Legends uh, about a month ago <clears throat> with the movie launch that happened, I'm sure you guys might have seen the Michael Bay film. Anyone in hands? Michael Bay film, seen it? Yep. Okay, so when that happened, we were in a unique position because we had not only um, the movie app launching, but we also had Transformers Legends, which had been out in the market for about a year. Well, it's a natural point to do uh, a cross-promotion. So we ran some stuff in the Legends app as well, kind of around the film, and we saw a nice immediate lift. So I guess my point there is to take advantage of the marketing opportunities that come your way and cross promote things when you can. And then I think the last point is just don't take your customers for granted. Always try to delight them. Always try to treat them right and make sure that you're paying attention on forums and that you're addressing their needs and really, you know, listening to their feedback because they're telling you what's going on in your game. And too often I think we sort of get into an ivory tower of we think we know what's right when oftentimes we'll make a change and suddenly disrupt the flow of a game. And so it's really important to pay attention to customer feedback. And those are the, the really three key things that we do, spend a lot of time doing, so. Bart, I noticed you nodded yeah, yeah, vigorously. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we uh, were surprised by was um, getting an actual interaction with the players over a long term ended uh, being uh, very efficient 
uh, for introduction of new titles. Uh, we saw a lot of players convert from first-timers to ambassador players. So each time we would launch a new uh, title of a game, we, s we saw those players coming in first and bring in revenue and new players as well. They would be bragging around, say, I've, I'm pl I've been playing this game for, for three years now and there's a new title coming out and you should try it. So it, it is all, all, also helping us with user acquisition as well. Uh, and it, keep that dialogue going on with, with players and, and be honest about what you can and what you can do with the upcoming titles. And if you are realistic uh, to your players, they will be realistic to you as well. You can just tell them what you're do working on and, and, and be honest if you can do all the stuff they want to be put in the game. And it really works for us. And you look like you're ready to jump in, Mike. Yeah, I just kind of want to piggyback on that. I think uh, what both these guys are saying is totally on the ball. And there are a bunch of ways you can get creative um, as a company to try and kind of suss out what your players want. Um, you know, some things we do at TinyCo, we have like an inner circle of power users that our community team speaks directly to. These are people who are whales who spend a ton of money and also play the game and evangelize the game. So kind of getting their direct feedback is important. Um, creating your own kind of open forum channels, whether it's like the Facebook page for your game um, is really good. And then also just kind of figuring out where players are talking about your game on the web and just kind of lurking there and seeing what the conversation is, uh, is like all three of those are really helpful. And I also think um, if you can find those ambassador players that Bart's talking about, um, and do something really special for them, they can have an incredible, incredible impact on the kind of power user community of your games. So like today in Family Guy, we released this event uh, that we partnered with Comic-Con for. So like Comic-Con comes to the game and um, all this Comic-Con stuff is happening. And uh, one of our power users runs a blog called Family Guy Addicts, which doesn't have you know crazy reach or anything like that, but all of our power users read that blog. Um, so we actually worked with Fox to get her a pass to Comic-Con and sent her down there to go to the Fox booth, hang out with Family Guy people, and just do whatever else she wants at Comic-Con uh, and have a great time. And she's down there right now just blogging like crazy about how much fun she's having and how much she loves TinyCo and how much she loves the game. Um, yeah, so I think getting creative and, and kind of thinking outside the box doing stuff like that can be really helpful in terms of how to engage your players. Amy, we've got to hear from you on this, too. Uh, well, like I say, we're uh, mainly a premium company, so it is a little bit different, although definitely there are channels that you can hear from your users. We are very active on different message boards. Um, we're constantly looking at our, uh, our user feedback. In fact, we recently did a free app a day with Amazon, and we got some really interesting feedback that we completely changed a lot of uh, the the uh, integration points we had in our game because the Amazon users are very funny. Like if you have a game with even Flurry in it, there are people who will actually pull your game apart and say, you have Flurry in your game and you are invading my privacy. I'm gonna give you one star. It was crazy. So we're like, okay, well, this for this particular user base, we are going to do things a little differently and we're going to give them what they need and, and uh, all those one stars went back to five stars immediately. So um, again, a little different for premium, but the message is still the same, that you have to be listening constantly to what your users say and react to it in a way that makes sense. One question that I know comes up with people I'm working with is, is it possible to go from one monetization strategy to another or flip back and forth in between monetization strategies? And how do you do that, or can you do that successfully? How about we start with Amy again, since oh, you have the mic. Get it off my mic. <laughs> uh, I think it certainly can be done. As I said, um, it's easier to launch, for example, as a premium title and go free later on, ad supported, than it is to go the opposite. Uh, right around the time we launched our first game, there was another team. They launched, a, it was called Punch Quest, I think. And if anybody remembers all of that, there was a lot of stuff in the news about that. That they did a free to play game and they got like millions of downloads and they made zero money because they didn't really know how to make a free to play game. It's not as all these guys will tell you, and we used to work for a free to play company, so that's one of the reasons why we do premium because it's really, really hard to do free to play well. It is, it is a lot of science and a little bit of art, but a lot of science. 
and a big financial investment. And so uh, this, this company who did PunchQuest released this game, made no money, and then they went back and tried to make it paid. And that totally didn't work because everybody's like, last week I could have got this game for free. That's crazy. I'm not going to give you my dollar now. And so it's a little challenging, but uh, it is very common to go paid and then go ad supported later or have a, an, uh, an offer wall where you give away a certain number of levels and say, okay, after level 10, you have to pay $2.99. David, I, you have a lot of experience in this side of things. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I'm going to say, I mean, so DNA, all we do is free to play games. That's, right. that's our, our bread and butter. But I think, you know, the important thing to consider is, is when you're designing your game and spending time, think about which model you want to pick and then go do it. And really think hard about uh, how much you want to charge and what your type of customer you're going after and try to match that up together. Um, Amy, you were saying that, that free to play is kind of a, a lot of science and a lot of art. I would actually counter and say it's a lot of art and a, lot, a little bit of science. I mean, it really depends on how you build it and what you're trying to do when you bring users in and keep them in the game. But um, there's certainly, you know, we have a, like a, a secret sauce we do with a lot of games. and. Really, it comes down to just <clears throat> applying the best metrics we know and adjusting the game and tweaking and, and also having a bit of risk. We never, we never, we're not afraid to fail. There's a lot of games that we you know, work on, build it up, go back, tweak and change, and then if it just doesn't work, we, we let it go and we kill it. You know? But we're never afraid to keep trying and risking things because we know at some point some spark will hit, a game will do well, and then we're like, that's amazing. Nobody expected it to do like that. So, yeah. And does that color how you work on new games based on those types of successes? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's important to look at different genres and see what works in some and then apply it to other genres as well. You gotta be afraid to, you can't be afraid to mix the pot. I think there's, there's always room for innovation in, in, in the mobile space. So what works, you know, one year is gonna change and evolve into a new type of gameplay the next year, you know? In 2000, uh, 2010, we were all, you know, raving about, um, infinite runners and jumpers and now we're looking more at you know puzzle games last year was all about candy crush this year it's something totally different so you can watch those trends and anticipate where they go but more importantly just just make sure you improve on them and do something different don't be afraid of it you know so i think this this especially this in the last month or so we've all watched the rise of the kardashian game it's doing amazing so um, who knows there's probably going to be a whole slew of celebrity games coming out soon we'll see so. does anyone else have any thoughts on this on on these types of uh, models, yeah, I, mean, I think I think as a young developer, and if, especially if you may not have the backing of, of a lot of money, or you're just getting out there, trying to figure out these things is really helpful to have experts like you guys. Lead yeah, I think uh, one of the things that happened in the market, uh, kind of overall, maybe starting around like 2012, is. A bunch of companies realize that you can't science your way to fun in a game. Uh, you have to have a game concept that is that comes from game design, not from a business model. Um, I think there are maybe a few companies out there still that are so good at the data science approach that they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Um, but for the most part, there was a large shift in the market where with the exception of the couple companies who are the best at that, everyone either had to kind of change their design philosophy to rely more on traditional game design and thinking critically about like what is fun and what do people like to play um, versus what's going to make money. Um, and a bunch of the companies who didn't make that transition don't exist anymore. Um, so yeah. I kind of agree with David on that. I, I kind of agree, but I kind of disagree at the same time because I was recently in uh, sitting in a conference room in another company. It was a big free-to-play company, and they were actually talking about their process. And it was literally like, and it's a very successful company, but it was literally an hour of looking at different spreadsheets. And it was really funny. A lot of the indies were like just completely glazing over. And after people were like, I'm not an actuary. I'm a game maker. So it definitely, I, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to talk smack necessarily about free to play, but it's interesting. I went to a panel yesterday morning and it was entitled fuck free to play. So I'm like, well, that's really interesting. I got to go see what that's about. That looks really kind of, you know, this is either going to be a total pro free to play or it's going to be the opposite. And I don't know. I don't know what the bait and switch is going to be, but it was really interesting. And, and part of what this guy's thesis was, was actually that if you don't know what you're doing, 
you can get into a lot of trouble very quickly because a lot of small companies that don't have big resources say, I'm going to make a free-to-play game because everybody's doing free-to-play. That's the only way you can make money because Flappy Bird, hey, look at that. You know, this guy is making $50,000 a day, although no one really knows if that's true or not. But, but still, I think this guy's thesis, and I kind of agree with it, is that it's kind of in your DNA to be a free-to-play uh, person and you really understand the business of games. And if you don't understand the business of, of games and how you're going to make money at making games in the free-to-play space, which is very complicated, it, you can get into trouble really quickly and make no money. But I will say like DNA, for example, and TinyCo do really stand out as companies who really, really know what they're doing in this space. And so it is in your in their DNA to know how to really do a great job at monetizing and, and putting out great products. And, and keep in mind, we've been doing premium and freemium for the last 15 years, and it's still there, you know? It's, it's not all free to play. And with the upcoming iOS 8, the bundles, we'll probably see uh, cross the uh, Humble Bundle works, works as well. So if you if you can't manage in the free to play domain if it's too tricky for your uh, game concept or you don't think you have the long tail definitely try freemium as well because it's still alive so one thing that i know i've been doing a lot of in the past couple years is uh ancillary revenue from gaming products um how familiar i mean how much is ancillary revenue such as merchandising and tie-ins and sponsorships, how much is that a uh, part of your business strategy? And how about I start with Mike? Sure, so I'll kind of flip that question around a little bit. So uh, we've licensed the Family Guy IP from Fox, so we don't see any revenue from uh, you know merchandising or TV, but uh, we do indirectly because um, since we've licensed that IP, we can leverage all of the incredible, like high impact marketing channels that a huge IP that lives on television has. So we have, tel we have free television commercials running for Family Guy every week all over the world. Um, you know, we get to leverage fo uh, Family Guy's 55 million Facebook likes. Uh, we get to be on Fox.com. We get to work with international like syndication groups uh, to try and get more TV. Um, so from that perspective, the, those types of partnerships are incredibly, incredibly important. Um, they're like key to that game's success because, you know, a developer like us, uh, you know, we're not going to spend money on TV spots. That's just like not something that we can do right now. Um, so having access to that super wide reach, um, you know, essentially really highly targeted, high value TV inventory, for example, um, you know, like it. Those commercials run during animation domination on Sundays when Family Guy runs, so you're definitely hitting the right people. Um, is fantastic, and you know, trying to work with their consumer products and home entertainment groups so that we do um, content tie-ins, you know, or something like um, you play the game and you get a coupon for something that you can buy online, some Family Guy merch. Or um, one thing that we're doing with Kid Robot right now is uh, they're coming out with some new like vinyl figurines of Family Guy characters, and we're actually taking one of the characters that they've created and putting it into the game as like an outfit. Um, I think it's called Intimate Apparel Peter. Um, so it's like Peter dress up in sexy lingerie. Um, and so we've done this partnership with them where we're gonna put this outfit in the game and uh, promote the kid robot figurines inside the game, and on every single kid robot box of that figurine is gonna have a sticker that says, you know, go download this game and uh, put in this code to get, you know, some free stuff. So uh, kind of coming at it from a little bit of a different perspective, but being able to leverage all that, those different parts of a big media company, uh, super valuable. And from a smaller game perspective, well, actually, it looks like you're going to, no, go ahead and jump in, David. Uh, well, I was just going to say back to the answering the original question, I mean, coming from an IP-based company, we're always looking at opportunities. If an IP becomes successful and you can do something with it to go into a different realm, then by all means, go for it. Uh, we've been approached by several companies who have said, hey, we love your characters and in this particular game, we want to go create like um, properties based on that. And so we're always interested in those things. It's not core to what we do, but we definitely recognize that it'll bring you additional audience if such a thing happens. So if you're lucky enough to create the next Doodle Jump or Angry Birds or something like that where you have a really cute or interesting character, 
go for it. Find a way to, to, to leverage it and create an audience that goes beyond the borders of your app because that would be an amazing experience to have, you know? If, just, if, you, if you're in doubt, go walk into a toy store these days and look at, see how many shelves there are Angry Birds on. You'll be amazed. So, um, you can think, come to our office and see all the cut the rope yeah, stuff. <laughs> but I, I think the point that I really want to make is that mobile gaming is great on a device, but if you create something or have an experience or a brand that can go beyond the borders of that, by all means, go for it and chase it down. It'd be an amazing experience because it takes it beyond just, just the, the screen itself. So, yeah, and still a lot of biz dev is, are hesitant about uh, trying to combine those worlds. Like it's still without their comfort zone to go to another channel or, or look at merchandise. And we see like the, the interest is growing from both sides. Like uh, the company is owning the IP, seeing possibilities, seeing what Tinyco is doing with with, uh, with Family Guy. So they're starting to reach out as well, and, and retail starts to reach out. See, so, yeah, maybe you can extend the game uh, with actual appliances, and uh, it's just, it's a it's a trend. It will definitely increase mm -hmm. in the next year or so, and see uh, um, much more crossover between actual games and merchandise as well. Well, it does. I think in some ways it's almost flipped. It used to be you would, in some ways, uh, Mike, you're in a traditional world. You have a, you have a property and then you create a game from the property. But now things are getting flipped. And of course, that makes everybody crazy in the rights world because they don't know what to do with it. But it's interesting anyways. Amy, what do you think about it? Um, well, certainly that's always the ideal, that your game is so popular that suddenly you see t-shirts and figurines and stuffed animals and lunch boxes. That would be really great. But in terms of uh, second party development, there are a lot of big companies like Amazon that are starting to do second party development and they're taking external pitches from smaller companies. And one of the things that they're specifically looking for because they're a huge behemoth with all these different marketing channels and retail channels, they are actually looking for games, somebody to pitch them a great game where they can say, okay, great, I can sell stuffed animals there and we have a film studio and we can make cartoons of that or whatever. So they, um, there are definitely opportunities to kind of, if you don't have a property that, you know, if you're a small company and you can't necessarily do that yourself, but you have an idea that's marketable, you can actually partner with somebody like Amazon and take advantage of that huge retail channel. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to give you a chance to sort of toot somebody else's horn. So I'd love to know um, and, and be specific and give some examples of, other than your own brand, what are some properties out there that you have recently seen that you think are awesome and have a chance of breakout success and why? Tell us why. So David, can I start with you? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm going to toot the horn of... So I, I was thinking about longevity, tying it back to the original um, idea of the panel is why apps stick around so long. And I want to ask, actually um, ask the audience, um, uh, how many of you are still playing a game three or four years later on your mobile phone? Can you raise your hands? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I see a couple hands. So the reason I bring that up is because there's a couple apps out there that to me still deserve what I would call the champion's trophy for being on the app store and still being relevant a couple years later. One of them that I think is still does a great job, and even though it's a paid app, um, is uh, Doodle Jump. You know, that little character just keeps going on and on, and every time I open that app, I still see something new in there that that, uh, that team has put in. So to me, it's, it's now four, three to four years later on that game, and it's still doing reasonably well. So that's, that's one that I've always thought did a, a pretty good job. They're, they're a, a company after my own heart, yeah. obviously. Yeah, <laughs> indie, small, but they've built it up into a pretty big thing. Yep. So, anyway. How about you, Bart? Um, we've been working with a lot of uh, ad tech companies in, in, in Europe. We see that lift off. We see crossovers with brands as well. Uh, and I think uh, within the, the children's segment, we see the possibility to develop uh, long-term franchises uh, from uh, from from games like uh, we get the feeling that there are uh, a lot of companies actually are looking at targeting specifically that audience. But we also see, uh, especially specifically in Holland, because of the lift of Netflix and the similar services, we see that uh, building on TV uh, uh, is also very interesting. So, do you have a particular game title that you just love? Mm. That's not yours. Can't be yours. Oh, it can be yours. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Walking Dead, the series. I really like it. Yeah. And why? What about it grabs you? What, what about it compels you? Um, we've been experimenting with episodic 
uh, as in releasing multiple episodes and see how you can actually use that to build a long tail on existing players. And I really, really like how uh, The Walking Dead is set up in that way. Yeah. Very good. How about you, Amy? So I actually just saw one this morning, and for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of this product. I have the guy's card in my bag, but unfortunately I can't remember the name. But it's over in the Indie Prize booth, and it's a little Tamagotchi game, so you can actually customize your monster, and you can play with it and feed it and do all those things. But they've got this really interesting tie-in, and I'm like, wow, I don't think I've ever seen this before, where you can make your monster, and then you can actually pay like 25 bucks or something and get a 3D rendered version of your monster. And I'm like, wow, that is actually great. And I'm not sure I've ever seen that before, especially taken on by a little small group. So they're trying to figure out how they can build their audience so they can actually get, you know, lower their production costs on these 3D objects. And they have t-shirts and they're really thinking really big. And But they've had a very soft launch and I don't think they really totally know how to market it yet. So I'm like, wow, what a great opportunity. So, so I'm guessing there's going to be a mass exodus there, to yeah, see them. There are big <laughs> publishers in here. Go find them because I think it's really cool what they're doing. Sure. Uh, so I think what Bart was saying about Telltale is they're so awesome. Uh, they're doing something unlike, as far as I know, any other game developer out there. The story engine that they've created uh, and the content that they've created with Walking Dead Seasons 1 and 2 and Wolf Among Us is unbelievable and uh, just so much fun to play, such a different kind of interactive gaming experience. I always look forward to the stuff that they're coming out with um, and just such a great uh, experience on the iPad. Also something that like I originally played the first season of Walking Dead on my Xbox or something like that uh, and then started playing Wolf Among Us on my iPad and it's it feels so much more immersive and cool. So like totally hats off to those guys. And then in terms of mobile stuff, um, I don't know about this game becoming like a breakout hit, but just in terms of games that I thought were really creative and, and kind of fresh and fantastic. There's a game, it's actually like maybe two years old now. Um, I can't remember the developer, it's called My Singing Monsters. And it's kind of a take on, um, you know, like a village builder where you like collect all these different monsters and upgrade them. But uh, they each sing a different tune. And so depending on which monsters you activate, uh, and how you like evolve your monsters, you actually create music in your game, uh, like different pieces of music that you can save and share. Uh, yeah, and it's like super adorable characters and just like really well executed, so. That actually brings up something I wanted to ask because you know I know there's always a debate whether it's gameplay or characters that make uh, a, a game initially grab you and then keep you engaged, so. Um, I'd love to hear your perspectives, everyone's perspectives on sort of the gameplay versus the characters or what combination or what, what in your opinion, um, makes a game very compelling to the masses. And why don't we just go down the line again, David? Uh, actually, I'm going to pass. I'm still thinking on this. Okay, you're thinking on it, Bart? Then you're on the, you're on the hot spot then, Bart. Okay. Um. Well, we, we've got a pretty successful franchise which revolves around story. Uh, initially, we, we thought story would ruin replayability because once you've played the story, you've seen how it goes and you'll end up putting the game away. But apparently, the combination of, of compelling story and fun gameplay uh, keeps players engaged. And also, uh, it's the same with TV. Like, if you have like, the season finale, you, you want to see the next season of Game of Thrones. You just want to. And, and we got that same feeling with the, uh, the IP we're working on as well. Uh, so story-wise, I would say it's just yeah, really, really helps. And initially we thought it wouldn't, but it's just we've got players who've, who have been playing, have been transitioning from PC download to tablet, and have been playing the game for seven years. So it's just beautiful. That's great. Yeah. Amy? So I personally think that gameplay is, is probably the most important thing because if you have a cute character and crappy gameplay, that's just not really gonna buy you anything good. But I do think it really helps, like I think Cut the Rope, which is one of Jolene's clients, has that really good uh, combination of a really fun gameplay and a really cute little character. So when you, when you fail a level, you're like, oh, my guy is sad, I feel bad, I let him down. And so I think if you can kind of harness that, like have the fun gameplay, but but insinuate a character in there that you want to help, you want to help him move forward or her move forward, I think that's kind of the, the magical sweet spot. Yeah, I agree with Amy about uh, kind of gameplay being 
more important, I guess. Uh, but one of the things that we've learned at TinyCo over the past couple of years is that creating new IP and new characters that's completely original, that has like gripping, interesting narrative content is incredibly hard. Uh, like it, it is very, very hard to do. Um, and it's just something that like wasn't a core competency of ours. Uh, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons I think why for us Family Guy was uh, such a fun and a great opportunity for us because we basically get to play with this very deep established world that has amazing characters you know, that have been on air for 10 plus years. Um, and you know, for that game, we work with the writers of the show who make sure that the characters themselves really shine through. Um, so in that case, we almost like got off the hook a little bit and were able to really focus on the gameplay and making the gameplay um, as fun as possible and like having the great Family Guy characters really feel authentic was like the icing on the cake for us. Um, but yeah, totally admire Bart, like what you guys do because it's really, really hard. And uh, we like we have tried in the past with some of our uh, wholly owned IP games and yeah, it's just very difficult to do successfully. Are you ready now? Yeah, I was just <laughs> brewing on a couple thoughts. So uh, um, one thing I would say is, is I would agree that gameplay really matters the most. What you do in a game is, I mean, the characters affect that, but what you really want to do is come back and play it more and more. One of the games we just released is called um, World of Thingies, and it has a perfect example of this in that the thingies that you uh, start to play with are all really cute little characters, big eyes, and they some of them cry, and some have little tails and ears and stuff. But what makes them cool is what you do with them. And you play with them in a match three puzzle game, and then at the end, the thingies you line up on your team battle the other guys you're playing against. And it's a real-time player versus player match three puzzle game. And um, I think the core of the th point that we've noticed is that a lot of our fans and people who play the game are like, oh, the thingies are so cute, we like them. But what really brings them back is, how do I play with those thingies and what do I do with them? And that's what's made the game successful. So I would say that the gameplay is the higher element there to focus on. Well, we're, get, we're getting close to the end, so I want to ask one more question, then we'll open it up for, for questions from the audience. Um, and so the final question I have for the panel is, uh, what are the top three things that you believe are crucial to keep success flowing once you have released your game? And Mike, I'll start with you at the end. Sure, uh, I think we've, we've talked about it, a bunch of the ones that come to mind right away, but one thing that we might not necessarily have uh, touched on is with free to play and games as a service, uh, current or past success of a game does not predict future success. Um, and I think it's really important to, if you have a game that is successful, uh, to not get lazy and not rest on your laurels. Uh, the mobile gaming market is insanely competitive, which is awesome as a gamer because there's so many great games I can go play. As a developer, it means you have to be constantly working very, very hard to make sure that you're introducing new content, you're making the game better, you're tweaking the system so that um, you know, your players come back and play for um, you know, years, months or years. Um, that's how you're going to create, you know, a really, really successful game. For us, like with Family Guy, we kind of think of Family Guy as a platform in itself, um, you know, that provides like hilarious, authentic Family Guy entertainment to players. Um, and then we try to think of, you know, content updates like event modules and stuff like that, um, that augment that experience and make it better. Because if we stop doing that, then people get bored and they go play something else. How about you, Amy? I'm top gonna, pa top I'm gonna pass for, for one second. Give me, give me a moment That's to think. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Bart, you're on the spot again. Um, I'm, I, I totally agree with Mike. <laughs> and on top of that, I would say invest in building a uh, uh, qualitative relationship with your players and, and try to get honest opinions about why they're playing the games, why they're actually replaying it and what they expect out of it. And maybe even ask them to tell you what should be the next step? What, are you, what, what, what would really make sense to you? And use that to, you, you can't really predict, but you can use those signals to see if certain stuff works. 
I would just I would agree with what's been said. I think one important metric we don't look at is is uh, that in the mobile age we can now test things really easily. So don't be afraid of numbers and spreadsheets and stuff like that. Go in and take a look at something and test it with a small segment of your audience and see how things work. And that's what you, where you can find some interesting things to keep them engaged and perhaps take the game in a whole new direction that you didn't expect. So. Yeah, I just want to add on top of that, we, we just, we had the same issue, we couldn't find a platform that allowed us to quickly test and validate new ideas. So we just built a, a free service called Playtest, playtest.st, to actually test and validate very early game ideas with actual players and see if you can actually get the feedback from those players to see if it really works without actually investing a lot of money of building a prototype or a first version that launch it to soft launch it and see how it works. So it's so yeah. you guys couldn't test on Android because I know that's one of the benefits of that platform is that Android is very quick to, to you can oh yeah, do a lot yeah. of iterations fast. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. With the story wise games, we the, the problem with the story is that you sometimes just want to validate the story. Okay. Got and it. instead of building the con okay. entire game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think for us um, as an indie company, a small company. Um, we not only have to build brands for each of our titles, but we have to build our brand as a company. And so when you're a small company, it's not enough to put out one good title. You have to put out multiple titles. And so everything you do after you launch a game is to put yourself out there, build your brand as a company, um, build excitement on the next thing you're doing and the next thing you're doing. And even when you're taking contract work, you have to like take contracts that will build on the brand of, okay, well, I could, I totally make sense that Clutch Play is working on this game, so it's going to be great. It's a good partnership. So for us, there is there is that kind of personal brand building that's also really important. Well, great. So I'm going to hand it to our MC here, and he's going to take questions. I'll just take a mic okay. They can share. Okay. All so right. who is the questions? Don't be shy. Come on. It's right here. Work your way back. All right. So um, as a longevity wise, I um, I have a question that um, do you th um, I want your opinion on if a developer should do uh, copy someone and be successful or in innovate, create something new and fail. Good question. <laughs> I think most developers don't mind being copied as long as the actual uh, copy is better. If you add features that make sense, uh, then everybody benefits out of it. Um, so if you if you want to test and validate specific uh, gameplay, yeah, you can start off by, by copying and see if it makes sense and try to innovate on top of that, that's possible as well. Or you just go all wild and test new ideas. but. Find find players at a very very early stage. Like you, you you don't need a thousand players, but just get 100 people or 50 people to uh, honestly uh, give you an opinion about what you're building, even before you actually start the coding. Just make a, a small game design document telling a story uh, and, and see how people interact to it. So yeah. So I think. <coughs> It's interesting. It kind of really comes down to what kind of game developer you want to be. Do you want to be a developer where is money the most important thing to you? Is artistic expression the most important thing to you? And that's really the first question because there's this idea of design plus one. So the idea of design plus one is let's look at what's successful out in the world and let's do a little bit better. Like one of the, the best performing games out on the market right now is Clash of Clans. And Clash of Clans has very famously said, we took Backyard Monsters and another game that was really successful and we're like, hey, we can do that, but better. And they, they're killed with it. So that gr that's great, that worked out really well for them. But there's also a lot of clones that kind of go for that exact market. And so if you're trying to clone something that already exists, Particularly in the in the free to play freemium world, why would someone who's already invested a ton of money in their gameplay of Clash of Clans go play your game when it's exactly the same or or just a little bit different? So if you're going through that design plus one philosophy, it really has that plus one has to be really compelling and great. So um, you know that that's kind of my thinking on that. But really, it comes down to what is most important to you. And if you're an indie, sometimes you, ha you can't really count on your success. Like, I, I wish you could. I wish you could say, oh, great, I'm going to put out a game and I'm going to be a multi-millionaire. But you can't necessarily count on that. So if, you're, if this is your full-time job, you have to structure your business such that if you're going to make a, a game that's kind of 
creative and fun and innovative, you can't necessarily count on that being a success. So you have to think of some other ways that you can bring money into your company if you're gonna take that leap. Yeah, I think uh, following up on what Amy's saying, the way we approach it is, uh, like when we're looking at our slate, for example, for what games are we gonna try to make for the next couple of years, um, we kind of have an acceptable amount of risk that we're willing to take for this period, which means some of the projects that we're interested in uh, are going to be less risky, and some of them are going to be more risky. Um, and the thought behind the more risky projects is, I mean, in general, they're higher risk, higher reward, but regardless of, even if you do like fail, like we decide, we get halfway through making a game and decide to kill it and not release it, um, those failures are still incredibly valuable because as an organization, you're building up different core competencies, whether it's, you know, whether the risks you're taking are like, we're doing 3D or, you know, we've only done mid-core games and now we're doing a casual game or we've only done wholly owned IP and now we're doing licensed IP. Um, yeah, so I think as long as you, from, from our perspective, right, trying to build a, a big sustainable business, um, the answer is kind of we do both at the same time. Cool, and, and step away from the, a lot of developers have a Superman complex. So they started building a game and then they start believing at it uh, up until a point that they're completely blind to uh, uh, outside critic. So keep in mind that even if you've been divesting two months of your time in building a game, you still might just kill it and throw it away because at a certain point, you just discover it doesn't work. But you learn something from it. Yeah, you yeah. will. I'll be real quick on this. Just that I, uh, being in business development, I get pitched a, a lot of games. I mean, a lot of games. And so what I notice these days lately is when a person comes in and says, oh, we've got a great game that's a Clash of Clans mixed with a little bit of uh, Candy Crush, and it's got a Saga map, my eyes just kind of glaze over because I think that's just not going to work. I think we need to keep innovating. And so it's great when you've got an idea that starts and crystallizes into something that's really innovative. So that's my, my thought. Can I ask? This is kind of off of a spin-off of what Mike said earlier, along the lines of engaging our social whales and making them feel special, but with a more of a practical budget for an indie developer, do you guys have any recommendations on how to make our social whales feel special without spending money to send them off to different places? Time, just, just get someone and say, well, on Tuesday and on Thursday, I'm going to reserve six hours after work, just go through all the feedback I get and try to build an honest conversation with people uh, that are uh, giving feedback on your stuff. And then really, that, that's where it starts. Like one of the things I noticed that it, it's a bit of a chicken, chicken and egg problem. With user acquisition, you need to have money. But in order to get the money, you need to have the sales. So you, you could start by just uh, investing in the first 500 of your players and hope that they will help you build the next thousand who will then help you the next two thousand which is far more controlled than spending ten thousand dollars a, uh, a month on uh, Facebook ads which of course is still extremely helpful once it's lifting off of course yeah I think uh, you know there's like that early stage startup mantra like do things that don't scale um, and that's definitely how we approach like building a community around a game um, is really like one-to-one -one attention with people that we've identified who are power users in our games. Um, and then in addition to just talking to them um, and trying to engage them and get ideas from them, uh, if you can show that you're really, like you're being nimble and you're listening to them and you're implementing things that they want quickly, um, if you do that like one or two times, it creates this amazing feeling of like, oh my God, this company is listening to my ideas and I'm in love with them now. So like when Family Guy came out, one of the uh, most popular like tickets that we got was um, I'm sitting down watching TV, like watching Family Guy and I wanna be playing the game, but none of the player actions in the game are a minute or less. So I can't do that. Like I can't sit and just keep grinding and keep playing. Um, we like hadn't designed the game for that use case. Uh, which was an oversight on our part. So luckily, um, basically all of those, get that part of the game system is configurable on our back end. So our product team met, uh, they decided what to do, and they deployed a change where like the first 10 characters that you earn all have a, a single one minute action. 
Um, so we did that in like, that was like a 48 hour turnaround from realizing that we had gotten all these tickets um, and people were over the moon. Like we had instantly generated, uh, you know, taken this kind of not anger, but frustration of our players and completely flipped it around into like, oh my God, we love you guys now. And um, you guys, I hate to interrupt, we are over. We're over our time. So we're going to sit over here so everybody will come down over here if you want to ask questions to the panelists after uh, we're done. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much. That was really informative. Very good.